take a call on a couple of matters. Uh, and it may come as some surprise. I might even wake Paul Quinn up if I'm lucky. It might even come as a surprise um, to members opposite, including Mr Quinn, that um, I'm going to speak about um, the fact that I think there's unnecessary law. I think some people on the other side of the House think I have a bit of a reputation for liking big government and, and lots of laws and lots of regulation. It'll be grossly... Un- yeah, Colin King's nodding. Yes, there we go. Well, well here I am to prove, pr- prove, you know, perhaps the exception, proving the rule, actually. But I want to speak um, in particular about um, the Minister's SOP number 176, which is uh, the SOP that um, some of us felt was more appropriately placed within the state sector management bill, uh, because it really is a a matter about the organisation of the state sector, but we, uh, we lost that debate with the, the current chair uh, earlier today about, about its placement and respect his ruling entirely in, in, in that regard. But what this um, particular SOP does is change the, uh, where the policy function for tertiary education is placed. I'm really not doing very well with Mr Quinn at all. Um, where the policy function for the um, Ministry for the Tertiary Education is placed. And currently that policy function is held uh, within the Tertiary Education Commission. No, it needs to be a white flag, Mr Quinn, not a, not a blue one. Um, <laughs> the, the policy function is currently held within the Tertiary Education Commission and uh, is to be transferred uh, back to the Ministry of Education. And, and on the side of the House, that's actually not a, a position we necessarily oppose. Uh, the, the Tertiary Education Commission's uh, functions uh, have been, you know, they've perhaps been overburdened. Uh, they've certainly had some, some issues with getting some of their core mandate completed, uh, and, and the policy functions some didn't always easily sit uh, with the Tertiary Education Commission. So they're to be transferred over to the, uh, to the Ministry of Education. But the question we have on this side of the House is why do we need to do this at all through this process? Why are we actually doing this through a legislative process? We, d- we don't think it needs to be done in any way, um, shape or form this way. The organisation of the state sector uh, uh, doesn't necessarily, reorganisation, doesn't necessarily require any kind of legislation. We had to do it earlier today in terms of Archives New Zealand and the National Library because of the statutory functions of the Chief Archivist, the National Library and the Turnbull Librarian. So what we were actually changing in the previous debate were parts of the Public Records Act and the National Library Act that deal with how do we protect particular functions. On this side of the House, we felt those protections weren't adequate. That's not what this is about, though. This is simply about a policy function of a particular government agency which the government has decided to shift. And so we, on this side of the House, certainly don't have a great problem with this particular concept, but really asking if we're just making law for the sake of it here, uh, and perhaps the Minister might want to respond as to exactly why uh, uh, they've gone down this path. But there's also this whole question of whether laws are actually required to do some of the things in this, uh, this particular piece of legislation came up during the select committee process, and that was around the issue of secondary tertiary partnerships. And there are, in fact, a number of very good models of secondary tertiary partnerships uh, in New Zealand, and this is covered uh, in part one of the bill. And, and there, were, there, are, there are a number of programmes, and uh, members of the House would have visited them. For instance, uh, the Tertiary High School, that's at Manukau Institute of Technology, which is a, an excellent model of, of working with kids who were... Well, the question is, did they need legislation, Mr King? That's the point. It's happening. It's, the point I'm making is it's underway. It's actually operating. And in one, one of the concerns that was expressed to um, the members on this side of the House was that if we move into a more legislative framework around this, will we be restricting the flexibility that's actually inherent in making these sorts of programmes work? And, and we know, a lot of us know about different kinds of programs like this around New Zealand, and, and the concern was expressed by some of the providers that actually, if we start putting in tight legislative rules around whether or not uh, how these operate, will they be able to continue to be the flexible, responsive kind of operations that they want them to be? Again, making very clear, Mr Chair, on this side of the House, we're strongly supportive of secondary tertiary partnerships like this. We need more of them, in fact. We need to make sure that children who are not uh, coping in secondary schools' traditional environments actually have a, have, a, have a vehicle to be able to continue on in training and education. And, I, and I'm sure the Minister's nodding, and I'm, she's may well have visited the Manukau um, campus as well, and it's an excellent model. Uh, it's not 
not the perfect model for every town and city and region in New Zealand, and there are other models that can be explored. So again, when we look at, and this is what's covered here under, under uh, Clause 10 of, this, uh, of, of the Education Amendment Bill uh, through to Clause 31, uh, the question we ask is, are we actually going to be restricting ourselves? We don't oppose it, but it seems on both these counts the law may be unnecessary. I call Christopher